Erica and Jason, Rebecca Lampkins, we've been working on that now for a couple of weeks. Her story exposed a much bigger problem beyond a woman who's living between the lines. Nobody ever bothers me. For many, Rebecca Lampkin is invisible. Despite the heavy traffic along US 36 in Avon, no one notices the woman living in the lot. This is your neighborhood, This right? is where I live. I just live in this parking lot. It's not something that I'm proud of. I'm just trying to survive. And I do whatever I have to do in order to survive. Rebecca has been unable to work for months. She has several documented health issues. When her partner died in June, she did not have the money to keep up with the rent and faced eviction. That means since October the 21st, Rebecca has called the Meyer parking lot home. She lives in the front half of her vehicle. Her cat Smokey roams in the back seat. Her trunk is her closet. I can't work. If I could, I would be. I don't like doing this. I never wanted to apply for a disability. But I have to because I cannot work. We met Rebecca on January the 30th the ice coating her vehicle. This is all the blankets. She keeps plenty of comforters to keep warm. She washes up with the Meyer bathroom and gets her medicines at the store pharmacy and spends a lot of time at the nearby library. This is not right. No, this isn't right. I shouldn't be doing this. Uh... We're, we're going to fix this. Okay. I'll... To get help, Rebecca, who has a master's degree in chemistry, applied for Social Security Disability Insurance. To get it, you have to prove you are unable to work or have a condition expected to end in death. I would prefer to be working. I'm used to taking care of myself. I'm not used to being in this situation. The 56-year-old began the process of seeking disability back in November 2015. Between March and October 2016, she's been dealing with two denials and an appeal. In November, Rebecca's doctor at St. Vincent Hospital provided an official write-up detailing her inability to work. Her case further delayed when she asked for an in-person hearing versus a video hearing. I don't understand. There are a number of people that really don't need it, that get it right away, and then there's other people like myself that they put through hell in order to get it and I'm tired of it and tonight we can report some results she's no longer living between the lines in fact she received an emergency payment that is allowing her to stay at a local motel she expects to get an apartment Jason and Erica in about two or three days some great news there Rafael bigger picture now just how big of a problem is this across the country well, Jason, let's take a look at the numbers because the Social Security Administration is very frank about the numbers. They say when it comes to the appeals process, the wait times could be over 560 days, which means that for someone in Indianapolis who was waiting on an appeal today, they would have to wait till the fall of 2019 to get that, that appeal done. We should also point out that contributing to this problem is the aging population. The Social Security Administration, though, is has implemented a plan it calls the CARES Plan which is focused on reducing those wait times. We'll see how that plan is implemented and we'll keep you updated on that and we'll bring you Rebecca's updated story in the next couple of days. Jason? Good evening, we'll focus on the materials and the structure. As you can see, it is pretty and pink, but also dangerous and possibly even deadly. The family had no idea about this. That that piece of wood and these you see right here were being handled by people that did not have a license and that did not pull any permits. And tonight the mom, she's upstairs and she has plenty to say. She wanted, you know, to see a castle and be able to look around and everything and be a princess like Rapunzel. Emma Bowling loves dressing up like a princess. Rapunzel is a favorite. The four-year-old girl who gets around in a wheelchair. She's a spitball. She is sassy. Um, she knows what she wants. So Make-A-Wish agreed to have a castle built in her backyard so she could play with friends. Ready, you sing it. Emma has several health needs. There's some water for you. 
diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy at six months old. She requires 24-7 care, so um, I quit my job to stay home with her. The reality is um, we were actually, every day is a miracle with her. Um, we were told at six months that we'd be lucky for her to see her first birthday and next week we're celebrating number five. Construction on her castle began in April, stopped in July, after someone complained to the city about the rising two-story structure. That was really the best news possible. It turns out the contractors doing the work were not licensed with the city of Indianapolis and did not pull permits. And per city inspectors, the contractors were building with materials that apparently were used before. And the project did not meet city construction codes. The structure would need to come down uh, for the safety uh, of this child as well as uh, many other children. This was supposed to be her princess castle um, that has turned into a nightmare. The disappointment and the letdown that she has that her castle still isn't done, is it's not fair for her. Let's fix this thing, come on. Sounds good. So here's the good news tonight at 6. New contractors will be here tomorrow to begin taking the next steps to fix this project. I did talk to the two contractors who did most of this work. I'm talking about John Bodell and Mark Thompson. Only Bodell returned to my call. He says that he was led to believe that this project did not require a license or permits and that they did buy new uh, new materials to make this work. I think in the end, both of those contractors need to make a big refund to make a wish and also write a letter of an apology to this family. Here's a statement tonight. From We're going to start with our chief investigator, Rafael Sanchez. He's in Franklin for us. Rafael. Hey, Melissa, so welcome to my backyard. You just saw all that water from Skycam 6 in HD. That water has to go someplace. And right now I can report to you that here in the Camelot Estates subdivision, that the water is beginning to invade some of the homes. You can see why. Melissa, this is all the aftermath of several inches of rain. And so we normally don't do this on television because we do not know where we're walking to. But since this is my home, I just want to give you a quick tour and a quick visual of how much water hit this place. In fact, my property line is beyond this pine tree. There is a small ditch there. And the last time the water got this high, as you can see, I'm 5'4", was back in 2008. This is a lot of water. I did check with the Johnson County Emergency Management Office. They tell me that the good news at this hour is that some of the water is receding along some of the homes and businesses in Whiteland, which is just 10 miles to the north of Franklin. That is the good news. Homes and businesses along Front Avenue. Also, there was reports of flooding in White River Township and Greenwood today. Again, the good news there is that in some parts of Johnson County, some of this water is going out, but in other parts, like in this neighborhood, the water is going in and folks already preparing to call their insurance company. We are live in Franklin in Johnson County. Rafael Sanchez at the middle of the water. Now back to you. Good evening. Somebody knows something but is not saying a word. And investigators hope that these orange bulbs will help. At the highest levels, this investigation is still top of mind. One family has spent the last few days mailing out flyers with the suspect's picture to people across the country. 1,000 so far as friends and strangers light their bulbs and remain alert for that wanted man. You couldn't find an orange light bulb anywhere around. Paulette Ferguson changed that shedding light on a plea to find the man accused of killing Abby Williams and Libby German. She's the lady behind thousands of orange bulbs that will remain lit until an arrest is made. I pray for the day we can just turn off our orange light bulbs and I don't have a have a party throw them throw them at something or just you know just just to have just to know that he's just that monster is away and not ever going to do that again. Soon after the Delphi investigation began on February 14th, Libby's mom began the orange bulb movement, drawing the attention of Paulette, who wanted to help. She emailed several companies. One company was willing to ship them, and she could sell them for one dollar. Another company, Westinghouse, agreed to send a semi with a surprising 2,500 bulbs. The only requirement, she could not sell them. A lot of them are like, well, how much are they? And I said, they're free, and they looked at you like, no way. Now people in Lafayette, Monticello, Buffalo, Delphi, and towns and cities in between illuminate their homes in orange. When I see them all lit up, it, it's just, sometimes it's overwhelming. Living in a small town, you just never think anything like that would happen. A bright gesture marking a dark moment in time. 
Paulette says if any of her orange bulbs burn out, she will have to go buy new ones. Why is that? Because she got so wrapped up, Erica, in passing them out that she did not keep any for her home. So oh, she, wow. if it happens, she's ready to go out yeah. to go shopping. Her focus, of course, was to make sure that that light bright, shinely throughout Indiana. So many people want to know what's the latest on this investigation. So this investigation is like an archaeological dig. Police have so many different pieces, but they're looking still for that one tip to put it all together. Of course, the key tips is this voice and the picture you're about to see. Down the hill, down the hill, down the hill. That was the recording of the suspect. And of course, there's that sketch. If you know that person, you're call, asked to call right now the FBI tip line, 844-459-5786. And Eric, I wanted to show you, and just got a picture of the flyers that uh, the family of Libby German are mailing out to people across the country. They've already mailed out 120 packets to date. Mm. They plan to keep on mailing as, as long as they need to. They're also gonna create a map to show exactly where all the different flyers are going. This is the first first property. Shannon Fernandez had no heat during the recent cold blast. Her furnace was set to be replaced before she moved in, but it wasn't because it contains asbestos. They should hold the um, Ocean Point responsible for their properties, um, close them down or fix them. And upstairs, other problems raise questions about why 209 North Addison was ever rented out, like the leak in the kitchen, apparently caused by the toilet use next door. When they flush the toilet, that's their toilet water coming down to my kitchen. So when someone flushes the toilet next door, next door, you get the sewage. And her fridge is on the porch. She says the kitchen electrical outlets are not reliable. Her leasing company, Ocean Point Investments, did offer her a chance to move to a different property. That location did not work out. She was also given a list of homes to visit. It turns out of the dozen that she could check out, none, as we learned, are in compliance with the city's landlord registry, each now facing a possible fine of $500. The registry allows the city to hold landlords accountable for their properties, like 951 Oxford. Based on what we saw, the walls busted out. and Ocean Point confirmed, it was not ready for move-in, but is on the list to be rented once the repairs are made. That didn't work out. We sat down with Ocean Point's attorney about Shannon's situation. Ocean Point is acknowledging there were issues that they were unaware of until very late in the process. Well, this is a, a very unfortunate situation, and, and of course, no property management company wants one potential tenant to run into the two properties within their thousand or so that have problems on the same day. He adds that the company has 1,400 rentals and is working with Eskenazi Hospital on a project to make housing available to low-income families in the city. It's that kind of partnership that helps the community, uh, not just from a business interest perspective, but from a community perspective as well. As for Shannon, she's wanting a home that's safe and has heat. Well, at least I have heat in my van. <laughs> but yeah, I don't want to face that reality of living in my van. That's you know? only a choice you want. That's not a choice that I want. Tonight at 11, Ocean Point is offering Shannon a couple of options. They're offering her either a hotel stay until they can fix one of the properties so that she can move in or a refund on her deposit. What about that registry and how it, can it empower you? Well, the registry, for example, includes the owner's name on the registry. That means if you need to take any legal action or you want to know more about the owner, now you have that information. Also, the registry will also list any code violations associated with with that property. As for Ocean Point, they will now have 30 days to clear up their violations with the city involving the landlord registry. Reporting live, Rafael Sanchez, RTV6.